Uh, so this paper is called Towards Optical Proof of Work, uh, and it, the authors are Michael Dubrovsky, Bogdan uh, Penkovsky, Luciana Kiffer, and Marshall Ball. And I think we might even have a microscope to go along with this, uh, with this talk. So live demonstration. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Mike. Uh, I'll be presenting Towards Optical Proof of Work. Um, so this image in the background is a prototype analog photonic processor that, that we developed for this project. So I'll be talking a lot about it, but uh, it definitely makes for a nice picture. So the, the overall vision of the project is to deploy a proof of work that can be run on these analog optical processors and generally processors with similar architectures. Um, and the reason this is interesting is because it could decouple proof of work from electricity prices. Because these processors fundamentally just have a much higher capex to opex ratio. So you spend most of your money on the hardware instead of spending a lot of it on energy because of the uh, you know, much more efficient processing. Uh, this would enable billions of new participants in the proof of work ecosystem because I mean, let's face it, most people just can't be a miner, certainly not profitably. Uh, if you buy a, a ASIC from Bitmain and put it in your house and run it, you will lose money every, every minute, right? Um, and this would build an orthogonal proof of work ecosystem that's, in our eyes, would be fundamentally better than the existing one, but would also be, have a different set of tail risks. So, you know, such that cryptocurrencies don't have to rely on a single set of uh, security parameters. And our fundamental goal is to enable proof of work to actually scale to the limits of demand, right? And the way we see it, it's already kind of failing, uh, beginning to fail to do that. So let's just take a step back and look at, like, what are the physical limits of store of value cryptocurrencies? Like, how, how, how much can they grow really from here? Um, and just like, what is a physical limit, right? Every system has a physical limit. It might be hard to find or to define, but for example, the physical limit of putting spheres in a space is close packing, which you can see with these bubbles. Um, but I, we think that for cryptocurrency, basically the limits are demand, um, throughput, which everybody likes to talk about, and the scalability of proof of work, meaning like, if you need to do proof of work to secure 100 times the market cap or 10 times the market cap of Bitcoin, do you really still get the same security? Does it really scale? And can you even do that much? Um, so demand is probably not a medium-term bottleneck. Obviously, there's all these non-fundamental issues like UI and people just knowing what Bitcoin is and things like that. But basically, most of the world lives without property rights. So if you look at the existing like 20th century technologies, for solving problems like that. It's basically, you know, good comp is gold and uh, offshore banking. And it, Bitcoin basically hasn't, hasn't even scratched the surface of the size of those markets. Um, transactions per second, you know, we won't really talk about because it's, it's really well addressed and will probably get solved to a degree. Uh, but is proof of work really scaling? And can it scale 100x? So where we are today, it's already centralized. Uh, both in the sense of like geographically and also in terms of being held by just a couple of parties uh, in large quantity. And this leaves it open to partitioning attacks as well as just general regulation, um, which only gets worse as you scale. The distribution's unfair, so really the mining rewards are just going to people that have access to cheap electricity. Um, it excludes pretty much every major city and uh, so like a lot of the population that might be interested in mining or participating, and the hash rate's unreliable. So when the price drops, miners go below their cost of operating and just turn off their machines. Um, and finally, it's, so nobody knows this number precisely, but the Cambridge Bitcoin Energy Index estimates that we're using 0.3% of the world's electricity. And some of us might think that's not a problem, but there's definitely people who think that's a problem. So it would be nice to solve. So the solution is to decouple proof of work from electricity. And so how would you go about doing that? Um, 
there's no fundamental reason actually proof of work needs to be based on electricity or even have much OPEX to, to, to secure a blockchain. And the idea that we started with is can we find a hardware platform and build an algorithm that'll actually have mainly hardware costs and very little energy costs. You could just take the piece of hardware and run it anywhere. Uh, you could run it in Boston um, because the electricity cost will be irrelevant to your, uh, to your economics. And so a low OPEX proof of work would first of all eliminate the cost arbitrage that's happening now for electricity prices, uh, which would solve a lot of the problems I've, I've talked about. I would help with geographic decentralization, opening up you know, a lot of markets for mining. And it's also interesting, you get some added bonuses. Uh, so if you look at what hash rate versus market cap looks like now, you basically get when the market cap dips, people turn off their machines, the marginal miners shut off, and you have a dip in hash rate, right? But if, you, if most of your cost is in CapEx, you can actually basically change this, whoop, wrong direction. You can change this graph in the following way. So basically, miners are always only joining. So as long as their operational cost is very low, even when the price drops, they have no reason to turn off their machine. Their profitability might drop, but they're already locked in. Um, and this means you get basically monotonic hash rate growth. Um, and finally, you get something called private mining that we like to call private mining, which is basically, you know, today you can't really mine privately, not at scale, right? Because obviously you need to bring in power and have a large data center, and you're, you know, usually dealing with a government to, to get that power. Um, we think of it kind of as basically having the simplicity and the security of proof of work with some of the benefits that people claim to have with proof of stake. Um, so how do we actually design an algorithm like this or a system, right? It's a hardware and algorithm pairing. Um, so in terms of hardware targets, we looked at, obviously, it has to have a low capex to opex ratio. So the hardware has to be expensive relative to the cost of running it. Um, and we kind of limited ourselves to technologies that are already commercialized in some way. So meaning you can go to a foundry like TSMC and actually order a chip that does something similar, runs on a sim similar technology. Um, in terms of algorithm design, it's very important not to design a new hash, right? So we kind of excluded that immediately. Uh, and the idea was, okay, as, as close as we can stay to hash cash, the better, right? Because it, you know, we're already changing so much it's ideally we would not change hash cash at all because it's been working for a decade um, and we want real deployment. And it's important to be backwards compatible with existing hardware, general hardware, because even if they won't be, somebody running a GPU is not gonna be profitable as a miner, it's important for them to be able to verify the blocks and also just a hobby miner, do test, test miners and so on. So, th so this is kind of the general framework which we we're considering and you really have to start with the hardware and do the algorithm second. Um, so, an interesting effect is happening, which is the AI community faces a very similar energy bottleneck to cryptocurrency in the sense that uh, deep learning is doubling its compute needs every three and a half months. So there's like a projection, you know, AI, it's similar to like crypto, that AI is going to use 99% of the world's energy and, you know, this kind of thing. And so, billions of dollars are being invested in developing analog multiply and accumulate architectures, which are several orders of magnitude more energy efficient on matrix vector processing, low precision matrix vector processing, which is the key component of a neural, deep learning neural network uh, computation. And so we went ahead and built a prototype of what we thought was the most promising technology, which is actually, there's a couple of companies that came out of MIT that are commercializing it for AI. Um, it's a analog photonic processor based on silicon photonics. So briefly, uh, this is the photonic chip, and you know, obviously a commercial, a commercial unit would just be this size, right? It's kind of all blown up because it's a prototype. And so it talks to a Raspberry Pi, which performs some digital computation and outsources matrix vector multiplications to this, to this silicon photonic chip. Um, just, I'll give you a brief kind of working principles background on how these chips work. So, this is our chip, and in the center here, you have a mesh of interferometers, which you can kind of see uh, schematically over here. And if you imagine putting light into this mesh as your vector, because you're trying to do matrix vector multiplication, 
let's say this is a vector where there's just a one in the center and all of these are zeros. So that one is gonna spread through the interferometer mesh depending on the settings here. And you, at the output, you get the vector that would have been the result of multiplying this vector by some matrix Q. And uh, I keep going backwards. Um, schematically, a laser basically puts light in here. It gets split evenly over here and modulated so that you can produce a vector of different values. So for example, it all, they all go in as ones and then you get a 0.8 here, for example, and so on. And then the interferometer mesh performs the matrix multiplication. And then over here, you collect an output and turn it back into digital. Um, but how do you build an algorithm around this? Obviously, matrix multiplications, you can't send a proof that you've done matrix multiplications. So essentially, we built a cryptographic construction to allow people to actually prove that they've done this. Um, and we started with just a basic SHA. So this is where Bitcoin stops, right? So you would do a difficulty check on this. It's just hashing two 256-bit values, and you do a difficulty check here. But we continued um, and took, took that high entropy random value, turned it into a vector, and the sizes of these things are kind of schematic, so they would probably be bigger. Um, and you pull a random matrix out of the blockchain entropy and multiply it by this vector, and you put it back into an XOR to recover the entropy of this, of this vector and hash that, and then you do a difficulty check on this output. And so the idea here is that the photonic chip would be your main cost and it would do the heavy work and then you would do a small number of hashes on a small digital chip. Um, so there is you know, some energy use associated with this but it's a very small percentage of what you would have if you just had a huge digital chip running SHA constantly. Um, oh, sorry. So the, the fundamental problem here is to make sure that uh, these matrix multiplications, you actually have to perform them, right? Because if you could run this algorithm some other way, uh, that's either a shortcut or it has a trade-off, like you do more hashes but less matrix multiplications or something, um, then you really might not be able to beat a digital system with a photonic system because there might be just some workaround. And so we, the concept of hardness is kind of weird for proof of work. Uh, so we, we had to, to analyze this, we had to develop something we call minimal effective hardness. And so the idea is basically if you have a function f, because you can kind of generalize this, right? It doesn't just have to be matrix multiplications. That's just what we did. But generally, if you have a function f, uh, the effective hardness is some lower bounds of doing a lot of these, you know, many, many uh, com computations of f, right? And in our case, f is a matrix vector. Um, and then you can yield a good heavy hash, this construction that we call heavy hash, by just proving that f is minimally effective hard. Um, and you know, our conjecture is basically that, in the paper, is that linear transformations are minimally effective hard. So that in itself could be like a 30 minute presentation to explain, so you kind of uh, approach me about it afterwards. And uh, in terms of future work, uh, we plan on doing further algorithm co-design with more advanced photonics, like uh, you can get a lot of performance improvement by just doing many wavelengths in parallel, uh, which is something you can't do digital at all. Um, and we've probably published some more fundamental analysis on minimal effective hardness separately, as well as some more analysis on the security budget implications of OPEX to CAPEX, which we started in the paper, but uh, probably have to expound on. And um, we're planning a live deployment of the OPAO algorithm with uh, DAG Labs when they launch at some point, probably at the end of the year uh, or earlier. And Finally, we're looking for new collaborations with developers of cryptocurrencies and uh, also hardware companies. Um, thank you. Uh, and I also have a microscope demo, but I don't know how much time I have. So somebody has, do I have time? Okay. Let's see. Yeah, so it's, so it's actually kind of interesting. If you want to do a Bitcoin ASIC or a cryptocurrency ASIC today, eventually you have to go to the best node um, so because light is just like the wavelength of light is much, much bigger than electrons. Like this is why we use electrons in, a, um, in electron microscopes, right? Because the wavelength is so big, there's no benefit to going to a smaller size. So actually these photonic chips, they're usually like the basis of this industry is data centers and, and optical transmission over fibers. So they're usually done in like 200 nanometer node or thereabouts. So it's like 20 year old technology. So it's much cheaper, uh, it's much cheaper to do 
It's, much, it's actually much cheaper to do an ASIC. Sorry. I can't, I have to turn around because I can't actually see what I'm doing. Um, I may have missed this during the talk, but uh, do you have any numbers for cost saving reductions you've seen for common use cases using this chip? So is your question cost savings or, or can, more specific uh, energy savings for yeah, some so, common operations? Yeah, so basically um, the companies commercializing this for AI are promising like 100x to eventually 1,000x more operations per watt than, you know, like a TP, Google TPU or something like that, um, but at lower precision, right? So that's the trick. Um, but if you look at, you know, transceivers, which are, the commercial, ver you know, the chips that are commercialized by the millions in silicon photonics are transceivers. So the, the energy savings are huge over what transceivers used to be, in, which were, you know, electronic chips. So it's uh, orders of magnitude, yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, this transition from OpEx to CapEx is usually invoked uh, for projects like Chia. Um, do you have any comment on, on um, storage-based Yeah, I, th I think systems? Chia and you know, proof of space time is a really good idea that does the same, kind of accomplishes the same goal. I think the differences are, A, that you know, storage is fundamentally not specific, right? So we're, we're building ASICs. And, and I think you get better security with, with spe specialized hardware. But also, I think the big differentiator is that our algorithm is just simple. We essentially use hash cache. So it's just, if you're really going to deploy something, it's better to deploy hash cache, in, 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 our, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so just quickly, this is, I'll just go through this thing quickly. Uh, so you can kind of see, if you remember the schematic of the chip from before, you can kind of see that this is the input waveguide where you get the, the laser coming in. And this is where, well, this is never, never works too well. This is where the uh, light gets split. So, one second. So the splitting happens here, and it goes, these are the modulators, which are controlled by electrical contacts. So you can see the electrical contacts here. They go out from the chip. And then, uh, oh, yeah, this is not a very good demo. But, um, so then you get an output here, and it's, uh, it's detected at these positions over here. So it's, if you remember the schematic of the chip, it's basically the same thing. But um, yeah, you can kind of see these bright little lines in the center. Those are actually the waveguides. So there's some dummy fill around. But these are the silicon. These are basically just silicon polygons that uh, are transparent to infrared. So they work like fiber optic cables. Like the surrounding is glass, which has a low refractive index. The silicon has a high refractive index. So they conduct light kind of like a wire. Um, uh, what's the error rate on calculations done on optical chips? So, so for transceivers, I think they try to get 10 to the minus 12th error rate, but you don't need that for um, you know, AI or this application. So you would go down to more like a 10 to the minus 3 error rate and have a much lower energy consumption. And this is actually, there's an interesting sweet spot because at some point you have so much error that you, know, you never mine anything. Uh, so, so there's a trade-off there. And it's like speed power error trade-off. Yeah, um, I hope it's not a, still a sensible question. I'm not a, a computer scientist. But I somehow didn't get uh, how you make sure that um, you don't simulate the same thing on a, on a, like, a stronger computer, basically. So how do you make sure? Uh, no, so so we are on that reverse machine? compatible with computers. So you can run this on a computer. The idea is just it's, it's purely that it's cheaper to do ah, it. Okay. It's designed just to be, you know, it's like, okay, what, is, what are the strengths of these chips? Let's just design around that, right? So it's an economic, it's just an economic uh, protection. That's all. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna read out two remote questions quickly, and I'm gonna sure. just do them quickly, and, but in the interest of time, I wanna get the remote people involved. Um, the OPAL paper aims to make a proof of work where CapEx is much more than OPEX. Isn't it likely that CapEx still amounts to energy costs, the energy used in all the production process? And the second question is, has anyone attempted to use inverse design for at least approximate, uh, approximating these types of operations? Um, 
Okay, so the first question, so, so this, we get this question a lot. So all human activity, I think, boils down eventually to energy. So anytime you do anything, so like when you buy a haircut, eventually the barber will go you know, buy some gasoline, put it in their car. The question is like how quickly it goes to energy. So if you just turn on your stove, it immediately goes to energy. Uh, if you buy a chip, you first have to cover all the R&D costs, the fab cost, like mostly it's not energy. And then at some point, all of those people that make money from this will go buy gasoline. Like at some point it turns into energy, but it's better to go through that chain than to directly burn, you know, uh, like thousand, thousand foot tall flame of natural gas or whatever we're doing now. Um, so that's, that's the argument. Um, and also there might be some velocity, there's kind of a velocity question. It's like, I mean, it, it gets complicated uh, to estimate what is the real, I mean, definitely anytime you produce economic activity, you're gonna have energy use. It's just going directly to natural gas is, seems like a bad idea and makes people angry. Um, for the second question, there's a lot of inverse design going on in, in photonics. So, you know, like the components shown here are not inverse design components, but there's a whole field of using inverse design to design like compact structures of silicon that'll do some transformation. Uh, it just tends to be hard to tune. So if your matrix is fixed, you could maybe do that. But if you're trying to be able to tune to different matrices, you, you need to have a lot of control. So it's just difficult to control. Like the components look a little bit like Swiss cheese, just like random holes in a, in a block. Okay, um, that's all the time we have. Sorry, uh, you can talk afterwards. Uh, let's give our speaker a round of applause.